Capcom have always enjoyed milking their franchises, but I don't think any two brands have had it worse than Street Fighter and Resident Evil. Even if we ignore the multiple re-releases of Street Fighter 2 on the 16-bit consoles, I, for the life of me, can't figure out why Street Fighter Alpha needed to be called anything other than Street Fighter 3. Sure, it's nice that all these colourful characters have their own interesting stories, and it allows players to attach something personal to their choice of favourites, but all of that is completely insignificant compared to how they play, and what collection of size, speed and moveset resonates with us the most. In an anime key-powered fantasy full of larger-than-life characters though, an excess of World Warrior tournaments for all these guys to keep popping up in isn't so unbelievable. However, when spin-offs, side stories and handheld-only games started dropping in the Resident Evil universe, a universe that is supposed to mirror our own much more closely, well, it starts to stretch the suspension of disbelief a little, and leads me to headcanon a lot of it out of existence. After all, if just about every secret bioweapons facility Umbrella sets up ends in a zombie massacre, you'd maybe think they'd reconsider this line of research. Let's face it, you'd have to be a real soulless piece of work to keep ignoring all this death in the name of your next big payday. That's right, we do political commentary on here now. Oh wait, we always did. Code Veronica was the first next-generation RE game, and I had the pleasure of playing it on the Dreamcast back in the day. It's still easily one of the best entries in the original run of games, with improved visuals and the most refined version of those mechanics we'd see, at least until RE1 Remake, which is still quite possibly the best survival horror game ever made. But why a Code Veronica? What even is a Code Veronica? Why not a 4? Why wasn't this story good enough to take a number? Well, this is in large part due to RE4's lengthy and somewhat troubled development cycle the root of which came from a desire to innovate rather than simply replicate. An idea I can get behind, but not a safe one by any stretch. No less than four attempts were made at putting together the next official numbered entry in the RE series between 1999 and the original GameCube release in 2005, which is also the year this happened. The most famous of these was no doubt Hideki Kamiya's first attempt. This placed a focus on stylish combat in a gothic setting, but strayed so far from its source material that it ultimately became its own IP, and brought the charismatic demon slayer Dante and his store Devil May Cry to the world. We also saw a version of this game known as the Hookman Edition in Capcom's E3 presentation in 2003. This game focused on Leon exploring a castle in very much a traditional RE style, while wearing one sweet-ass jacket, and being stalked by a powerful wraith-like creature armed with hooks. Looking at it now, it sort of reminds me of RE7 in the way it's set up. Leon was apparently going to become infected with the progenitor virus during the game, and would manifest powers in his right arm. The infection hook was carried over into the final game, but I guess the magic right arm got transferred over to Chris for RE5. Shinji Mikami wanted to do more though. He didn't just want another Resident Evil game. He, and I suppose by extension the world, had gotten used to slow-paced zombie horror and fixed camera angles that hid things, and he wanted to stir up horror gaming again like he'd done with the first one. While not everyone on the team was on board with it, Mikami wanted to rock the boat and head out into uncharted waters, create heart-pumping action and recapture the fear he felt when playing those original titles for the first time. This meant a new perspective, a greater combat focus against hordes of enemies, and entirely new creatures that couldn't just be shot in the head to be taken down. The resulting game is easily one of the most important and enjoyable action games of its era. It arguably did as much, if not more, for the third-person shooter as a genre than even Max Payne. Capcom did, however, divide their fanbase, many of whom wanted more like Code Veronica and RE0. And while most RE fans universally loved this game, it also muddied the definition of survival horror. Yes, sure, Capcom coined the term for their first game, so they can say that while this is survival horror, that's not all it is. And while this game does have plenty of campy, schlocky horror, it isn't all that scary and doesn't have any survival elements. So, to start at the end, yes, RE4 was incredible when it came out. It's the reason I bought a GameCube, and if nothing else, I have great memories of late nights spent with friends trying to outdo each other's times on Mercenaries. It is also absolutely amazing to play now, 
even though it does show its age in some places, but oh damn, did this game create a divide. So why don't we take a closer look at all the hows and whys of that. This is Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4. So before we go any further with this, I have to shout out the RE4 HD mod that I used through this playthrough and will likely use through every other playthrough of this game. Don't get me wrong, I also recently played through a chunk of this game at my local barcade on a GameCube with a CRT TV, and it was absolutely glorious. But failing access to original hardware, this mod is 100% the best way to play this game. I've helped out on several large-scale Fallout and Skyrim mod projects in the past, so I have some concept of just how much time and effort it takes to put something like this together. As such, the fact this was all put together by basically two people, that being Albert Martin and Chris Morales, completely blows my mind. Understand that this isn't some simple AI upscale of the original textures. These guys travel to the actual locations that many of these places were inspired by, and took their own HD photos, which were then turned into their own original texture maps. And make no mistake here, not a single thing has been overlooked. Everything from the environments and the characters, to the inventory and the UI, it's all bigger, better and clearer, and injects this almost 20 year old game with a quality and freshness that has me almost wondering if this is a relatively new indie or double A release. I honestly, could not think of a greater love letter to write to this game than what these two guys did right here. I am truly blown away by the work and commitment that went into this. If you're wondering how much time it actually took, then just head over to mission 2-3, jump down this shaft that can be found on the left hand pathway, kick down this door, and you'll find a special area added that, as well as giving you a cool silencer for your pistol, also details accurately two men's descent into madness as they painstakingly replace every texture in the game. The mod page will be linked in the description and I urge you to check it out and share your love on the creator's socials. From one 3D artist to another, this is unbelievably impressive and from the bottom of the cold dead fusion core that replaced my heart, thank you so much for this. So, if we can all be very honest with ourselves here, the writing in Resident Evil has never been that good. The basic story is perfectly serviceable as a setup for a game for sure, but if we all stop to think about it for more than a minute, it does fall apart quite spectacularly. So, you've got this pharmaceutical company doing illicit research to create the ultimate life form, which is apparently an 8 foot tall mountain of muscle that can be put down with weapons that can easily be fitted onto any land or airborne combat vehicle. They could have taken a cue from the most invasive and adaptive and damn near indestructible species on the planet, but the guys who conjured this up clearly got their start in anime like me by watching Gaiva. There is the simpler option of just releasing the virus and letting it turn everyone into zombies, which would leave you with… a city full of zombies. I'm quite sure there are biological and chemical weapons in existence in the world today that are just as deadly and don't have even half these drawbacks. But whatever, right? It sets up a reason for a zombie mansion in the first game, and later an entire city in the second and third. And Resident Evil has always been about the people surviving and trying to escape the fallout first, and the overly convoluted bioweapons plot second. To set the scene a little here though, the aftermath of RE3 basically blew open the whole Umbrella conspiracy, and the United Nations responded by crippling the company financially while hunting down and arresting as many executives as possible. This is exposited to us by our returning legend and yaoi heartthrob Leon Scott Kennedy, as he rides through what I assume is some rural part of Spain, where he's been sent to… are you sitting down? Rescue the President's Daughter. God I remember bursting out laughing the first time I read this. Because of course it's the President's Daughter. We've got to keep raising the stakes here, so if there's going to be a hostage, why not the daughter of the President of the United States of America? To be honest, this does wonders for the setting and the tone of the game because 
Make no mistake, the horror is long gone from this series now, and we are very much playing 90s action movie, The Game. Now look, I joke and I laugh, but honestly, this is all fine. It's just as absurd as the original bioweapon setup, and this was the era of Solid Snake and Sam Fisher, so why not send a single super agent to do the job of a joint American and Spanish military task force? Especially when that super agent is 50% of the B.O.W. John Wick tag team. How and why we are here is much less important than us just being here so that anarchy can ensue. And believe me, things take a downward turn from the first moment when... I'm not entirely sure about Spanish hospitality, but this is pretty much how we do things when strangers with guns enter our house in the UK. And it's about this point where my attempts at ironic humour stop because, make no mistake, I am absolutely able to suspend my disbelief once things get rolling, and the moment Leon is cut off and alone and surrounded by hostile creatures that can tank headshots and spit out the bullets, well, Resident Evil is back baby, and it's game time. So, I may be wrong here, but as far as I can tell, no one was expecting bioweapons to be part of this equation, as evident by this genius bomb Leon drops here. So, it seems like pure coincidence that Leon happens to be, once again, at ground zero for a new monster outbreak. You can probably headcanon the idea that mysterious forces within the US government, or maybe even Wesker himself, maneuvered Leon into this situation to see how he'd handle it. What follows here is Leon's epic adventure through the village of Val de Lobos, the castle of the Salazar family, and an island factory that has been converted into a full-blown terrorist military base. He'll have to deal with an entire community of people infected with the new Las Plagas parasites, and controlled by a collection of awesome and fun villains, straight out of some alternate Roger Moore Bond movie, all of whom have charismatic personalities and great and memorable boss fights. There are some twists and turns with old characters returning to throw a wrench into the works, and one guy who just appears out of nowhere, who we're all supposed to know from somewhere else apparently, though he is the most fun mercenaries character by far. So we have our objective, and we are once again a lone soldier trapped in a relatively small space surrounded by a horde of enemies that can walk through hails of bullets before going down. Oh, and to top it all off? Early in the game, our best boy here gets infected by said parasites, starting a countdown that will end with him becoming a mindless slave to the charismatic cult leader and mastermind of all this, Lord Sadler. Yes, it's campy, and even just a little dumb in places, but it all works perfectly with the tone and new gameplay style, and while nothing will ever be like that first playthrough where I may actually have been scared a few times, I can say that this replay was still incredibly fun. And since you unlock the Matilda at the end of it, I'm more than ready for another run from start to finish. When we first met Leon Kennedy, he was a naive rookie cop driving into town for his first day on the job. He had enough training to be competent in a gunfight I'm sure, but I doubt that can prepare you to open fire on another human being or deal with the actual living dead coming to tear your face off. The original RE cast were great horror game protagonists. They weren't completely useless bimbos who we have no sympathy for like Hollywood insists on making horror movies around, and they were just competent enough to allow for a believable amount of player agency while keeping us on the back foot through this nightmare experience. Sure, it's not the only combination that works. Harry Mason, at least as far as I'm aware, has probably never fired a gun outside of a range but he was suitably motivated by the need to save his daughter to brave the horrors of Silent Hill all the way to the end. But the OG RE heroes were a good match to the situation. Their jobs gave them motivation to be in that situation, to stay there and to figure it out versus just running like hell, and to be resourceful enough to survive the whole ordeal even if they were hanging on by a thread. But time has passed. Even in Code Veronica, Claire demonstrates near superhuman levels of athletic ability, reaction time, and hand-eye coordination. And she didn't go through the training Leon went through before he got here. So, in a way, while I do prefer my slow-paced horror to what RE4 offers, it all kinda makes sense that the whole tone had to shift. 
I'm not saying it's impossible to have a slow-paced horror experience with a protagonist as competent as James Bond, but it would be very hard to land for sure. So now Leon is here and after surviving the horrors of the Raccoon City incident and being betrayed by Ada Wong, he's much more well-trained and a damn sight more cynical. So I'm not sure how much I like this to be honest. Of course it makes sense. This progression is actually pretty natural, but I really like this guy. That being said, while he's not so naive anymore, the gentler, more honest side of him does shine through in moments and maybe that's part of why he's so good at his job. He has plenty of bad one-liners to laugh in the face of danger, but he has moments where he can be really empathetic and caring. He is, after all, looking after a teenager, and as someone who works with teenagers myself, you kinda have to intuit when they're feeling stressed if they need a clown to make them laugh, or someone to just talk to them like they're an adult and show them that they're respected and looked on as an equal. So with his hyper-competence and experience hiking across the lowest levels of hell, Leon is going to gun down hordes of enemies and roundhouse kick and suplex his way to victory. But a hero needs great villains to fight, and RE4 has a very impressive rogues gallery. There are three primary bosses who form the cult leaders of the Los Illuminatos, and each inhabits their own domain with its own unique architecture and feel to it. There is a fourth character here who is a mercenary and is... Well, he's odd. He doesn't fit at all. He pops up out of nowhere, hints at some previous backstory with Leon, fights him, and then he's done with nothing else to be added. We'll get to him though. Let's start with my favorite area, that being the village of Valdelobos. In some regards, this location is probably the most believable for me. Not that anywhere like this actually exists in rural Spain. I mean, certainly not one with a population of this size, but I've been to many a small town in England and wandered down many a winding country path. So for me, there's something familiar about that. There is a good mix of environments and enemies though. Nothing about this part of the game is ever particularly frustrating or cheap. Well, aside from these bear traps, which can be a massive pain when you've had enough time to forget where they are. I get that it's the starting area and the plan is to ramp up the difficulty as we move on, but this is just such good pacing. We are also introduced to a variety of weapons here, from pistols to shotguns to rifles and a variety of explosives. Our purpose here is to get acquainted with all the various systems and then try them out under pressure. A lot of areas make use of verticality and keep the space open so that enemies have a lot of options for approaching you as you try to fight them off. If you're smart and quick, you can steal the high ground and give yourself a significant advantage in many of these conflicts, but in general, you will never be completely safe. While we start with houses and of course the old church that sits at the heart of this community, we find a lot of new and makeshift constructions which I guess have been thrown together to prepare these people for a war or whatever it is they expect to come after this whole affair with Ashley has passed. We also get this pretty awesome stand your ground section as we are chased into a small house and forced to barricade ourselves in while enemies swarm in from the outside. I say this as someone who loathes stand your ground missions. I can't stand being pitted against some arbitrary invisible timer or kill count, but I can't deny this one really works. It's just something about the setting, the enemies, and probably the fact we're not exactly in this one alone that just makes it fun to play. This is also where we get our first big meeting with El Gigante, which is one hell of a spectacle and has the most awesome moment when... Yeah, boy, go for it. Always save the dog. At the heart of this domain is Chief Menendez. While not a true RE stalker, well, not in this version of the game anyway, he does show up to make trouble for Leon at a few points in these early missions before having his own significant body horror moment. And then it's time to do what we do best with monsters. Menendez isn't as charismatic as Salazar, who we'll talk about next, but he's also considerably less annoying. He's the imposing silent type that speaks with his actions, not his words. And I'd say he fits this area quite well, and his big fight rounds out this whole section nicely. 
It's after here that things take a bit of a dip if you ask me though. The next major play area is Salazar's Castle. And to put my thoughts on this place down as simply as possible, it overstays its welcome. By quite a long time if I'm being completely honest. On one hand, the spectacle and sheer absurdity of this place is pretty breathtaking. And there are some absolutely killer set pieces in here for sure, but on the other, I'd say all the most annoying parts of the game are found here. And while I usually do find myself grinning when Salazar first makes his appearance, god damn am I fed up of hearing his annoying voice by the end of it. Reminds me of another Ari villain that I can't stand. Why don't you stand there? Do something! Ethan, help! It's also in Salazar's castle that my suspension of disbelief starts to get very stretched. At the very least, I really need to reclassify what I'm seeing as a comic book universe rather than something that reflects our own in any way. This may also explain why characters in this series don't age. I mean, Chris is over 50 in RE8 and looks considerably younger than that. So here is where things start to get a little absurd, but also kind of frustrating. I think you'd be hard pushed to find anyone who particularly enjoys this section of the game. In fact, I can't stand anything that involves seemingly infinitely respawning enemies, or covering someone with a sniper rifle while also trying to be aware of enemies closing in on my position. Also, the fact that Ashley is with you means there are extra variables, some almost beyond your control that can land you with a game over. I've played this section myself many times now, so it's not like I worry about dying or losing here too much anymore, but I still roll my eyes every time I see it coming. Other areas such as the hedge maze full of dogs and the minecart ride also have me groaning as I approach them. Then there's these fucking things. The chameleon ones aren't so bad in the sewers, at least not after you've been this way a couple of times and know what to look for, but this control scheme and flying enemies just clash really hard. And again, there are parts where it feels like these things are just respawning on a timer, meaning you can't find a good spot to just clear them out from. This can be especially annoying because this game actually punishes you for being good with much more limited ammunition drops. This is one of those nice ideas on paper, but as speedrunners have proven, it actually incentivizes bad play early on to have an easier time later. All the way through the castle, we are taunted by Salazar, who jacks into our Metal Gear codec to constantly berate us and establish himself as a true James Bond supervillain, even going so far as to call Leon by his middle name addressing him as Mr. Scott. It's actually pretty cute seeing him have his little tantrums when things don't go his way. Now, I personally get tired of this whole section right around here. The castle and the creepy cultists were a nice refreshing change from the villagers, and while I've highlighted a few areas that make me sigh inside, they form a very small percentage of what is an otherwise fun location. But then we get to the boss chamber, and it just goes on some more. This boss fight with Salazar's right hand is pretty cool, but then having to go trekking through more of this place to get to our final encounter had me rolling my eyes. Overall though, Salazar is a fun enemy, even if he's not the most difficult of boss fights. You should be sufficiently stocked up and skillful at this point to put this guy down with little to no fuss, which takes us to the island and our showdown with the big cult daddy, the architect and mastermind of this whole affair, Lord Sadler. Sadler, you're small time. <laughs> the island is considered to be kind of a mess in terms of pacing and tone. On one hand, it has some of the most intense gun battles in the game, ramping up the enemy count, their overall threat level, and introducing a unique super heavy type with miniguns. Leon likewise should now be unbelievably overpowered, and we, so well practiced in this combat loop, that pistol headshots should be the standard, and one or two of the max should be all we need to finish enemies off for good. However, these super intense battles get broken up to deal with this fucking thing. Considered to be one of the most terrifying things in the whole RE canon, the Iron Maidens are living proof that good sound design is the heart and soul of horror. <laughs> We hear them coming long before we see them, and often when we do see them, we aren't usually in the position we'd like to be in to perfectly line up the shots that we need. I really like these fights though. They never get tiring. It's all a matter of skill, 
You can't move while you're aiming, so you've got to be precise and you've got to be fast. It incentivizes skillful play, which is exactly what a good combat loop should do. So let's talk about the characters, and I guess that means Krauser first. Krauser is kind of the Boba Fett of Resident Evil. That is to say, a considerable portion of his backstory was either cut or left out deliberately, inspiring a lot of people to overthink what he's all about. His story was expanded on in the RE Darkside Chronicles, but his arrival here is really jarring. I don't object to Sadler having a merc or a personal bodyguard to take care of Leon-sized problems, but why did there need to be any connection to Leon's past here? If the larger explanation was cut, why not just change this whole thing, or at the very least introduce him earlier in the game? As it stands, we've got a guy who's basically a double agent working for Wesker, with some unknown connection to Leon, from some unknown event in their past, which just feels messy, narratively speaking. He is a great boss fight, as I'll talk about later, but even now, I still look at my monitor completely puzzled as these guys talk to each other. Rounding out this area though is the big daddy and kingpin, Mr. Sadler. Now, this guy is a pretty good villain overall. Unlike other RE villains, he makes himself known to you from very early in the game, and while he isn't constantly breathing down your neck, you establish enough of a relationship with this guy to make him someone you really want to punch in the face. He's incredibly smug, and it's kind of satisfying in the late game when he finally starts to lose it with you. So that's our cast and our setting. I will take a moment to point out Lewis. I'm sure some people here think maybe I should dedicate more time to this guy, but hey, Capcom didn't give him a lot of time either. He's another lost soul here with his own interesting backstory to uncover. He is quite charming and funny, all things considered. See that the president's equipped his daughter with ballistics too. And he helps out in one particularly tight situation, but he's not around enough to get super invested in. This makes sense as we don't need more cutscenes and dialogue breaking up the game, and with the exception of RE0, Resident Evil games are lonely adventures. So I'll say he serves his purpose well enough, and is cool to have around for the brief time that he's there. So, our setting and cast are colourful and varied, and it all meshes to create the overall campy and hard-hitting action tone that the game is trying to portray. So how does it play exactly? Resident Evil has always been aware, at least somewhat, that it's a game, and has generally placed player experience and fun above realism. If the over-the-top characters and plots aren't an indication of this, then the save rooms and magic storage boxes are. Essentially, design choices were made so that the players would have a smoother and less frustrating ride through the Spencer Mansion, and this little saving grace was so well received in the face of all the other restrictions the game lays upon you that nobody cared about the minor break in immersion because they didn't want to do all that extra legwork. Well, not the first time anyway. Anyone who plays on hard mode is digging their own grave of frustration, but I hear you guys are into that, so have at it, I guess. I'm not against ultra immersive experiences, especially when things such as the HUD or other UI elements are well integrated a la Dead Space, but I generally favour placing player experience and fun above realism. So I've got no issues with coloured herbs that miraculously heal near lethal wounds, ammunition boxes that magically become clips, absurd puzzle locks or death traps existing in a mansion or police station because… well, because it's fun. It's Resident Evil, and I'm here for all that and more. So these little breaks from reality, along with the tone set by the story, setting and comic book rogues gallery of enemies, meant I was more than happy to embrace RE4 as something akin to an arcade or boomer shooter. I mean, it's not that big of a stretch. Enemies literally drop coins that come in cute little chests and boxes of ammunition that they've got no reason to be carrying. Now, sure, it's not as flashy as something that's trying to suck coins out of your wallet like House of the Dead, and it certainly has some of its progenitor's game mechanics in it to control the pacing and bring a more tactical element to the game. For one thing, you can't move while aiming, and there's some backtracking through certain environments, I guess. So in the Raccoon City saga, the focus was on limitations and basically doing loops of a locked up area, opening it up a little at a time, and generally avoiding combat as much as possible. This is simply because the best combat outcome was a dead zombie, and you minus bullets for that much bigger monster that you know is coming later. RE4, however, really leans into its combat as the primary gameplay loop. 
The tone is very much set at the beginning of the game when Leon stumbles into the village square and gets swarmed by enemies, including the dreaded Chainsaw Ganado that can one-shot you if he gets too close. This is probably one of the tensest moments in the game, as you haven't bought any weapons or upgrades yet, and you're no doubt at your least competent with the control scheme. There are many other hordes to deal with later, but... I'd say you've got this. The pacing of the game is otherwise solid. You are given every opportunity to get used to new weapons and even enemy types before the tension level rises. New weapons are bought from one of the entire Resident Evil Saga's most well-loved characters, the Gun Merchant. What are you buying? So I'm currently working on a video for RE7 and 8, and in the section about the Duke, I make several references to the Gun Merchant, so to avoid repeating myself here, I'll just leave a link to that video in the description. Hopefully it'll be finished before this one goes live, but if not, please bear with me. At your first meeting with this strange guy, who shall forever be known as Gun Guy among my circle of friends, you have the option of buying the hunting rifle. And while you don't have to buy it, it's very likely you're going to. Now, check this wall. Notice something interesting? This looks like a great place to pick off some Ganados at long range and maybe get a head start on thinning out their numbers before going through that gate. In fact, you see this wall before you even get to shop with Gun Guy for the first time. So the idea that you could use a rifle here has already been subtly implanted in your mind. Once things get moving, the pressure is always on, but you never feel completely overwhelmed. There's a constant sense of just scraping through by the skin of your teeth that can get your heart rate up and your blood pumping. There is a synergy to your arsenal that will have you switching out weapons rather than reloading them, and constantly moving and adjusting your position so that you can follow up stun hits with Leon's lethal roundhouse kicks and suplexes to finish the enemies off. The only thing the game is missing is seamless weapon switching, though that would mean we spend a lot less time in one of the best features here, Leon's Hitachi Briefcase. Okay, I get that I'm jumping around a lot here, but that's kind of what playing this game is like when all cylinders are firing at maximum capacity. The Hitachi case is another of RE4's wonderful gamey moments. While it's far more spacious than the previous entry's 6-8 space inventories, you're still going to need to make a few hard choices at least at the start. The case can be upgraded at specific points in the game to make room for more equipment, but a lot of item management is handled through a very interesting packing minigame that's so incredibly therapeutic that someone really could make it into its own standalone game. Oh wait, someone did. And it's called Save Room. Anyway, this is another of those concessions to reality that really makes this game so damn charming and fun. It's a real shame it got axed from RE5 and 6, but I'd rather not talk about those games if I'm being honest. So providing everyone has their briefcase in a neat and organized system like this, because if you haven't, I can't even begin to imagine what's wrong with you, I think we can dive back into the action. So our camera is now placed behind Leon and we have full dual analog or keyboard and mouse aiming making those oh so important headshots a lot less to do with RNG and a lot more to do with skill. But believe it or not, while no human is faster than a speeding bullet, it's surprisingly difficult to hit a moving target in the head with a handgun, especially when you're under a lot of pressure and honestly, headshots just aren't all that in this game. Position and timing have always been a critical part of Resident Evil combat. The shotgun, for example, can take out zombies in a single hit, but to get the maximum damage, they're going to have to be practically kissing the barrel, creating a system of risk and reward that is only increased by the presence of more than one enemy. You're doing something very similar here too, especially early game when resources are a little tighter. Headshots with the handgun can stagger enemies, leaving them prone to one of Leon's round kicks, providing you're close enough to connect. This baby actually has some AoE on it, so there's incentive to use it on a group of enemies as well. Once enemies are on the ground, you can follow up with a lot of free knife hits before they get up. Leon's incredibly powerful kung fu and pro wrestling moves are offset by the sheer number of enemies he has to deal with, and the fact they can move a lot faster than zombies, and some of them even have ranged weapons. Early game, you'll have to deal with thrown axes and dynamites, while in the late game, some of these guys are packing full-on miniguns to put an end to you. So, there's a hell of a lot of strategy involved in bringing down a large wave of enemies. 
The fact that Leon also can't move when aiming is just another figure to add to the equation of position, weapon choice, target selection and escape routes for when things get tight. For uninitiated players this can feel incredibly tense and frustrating, but like any good combat loop, you can graduate into such mastery that you barely think about what you're doing at all. You simply react to the visual stimulus and audio cues as you select the best weapons, the most dangerous targets to clear out first, and perform a fast turn and sprint into some space when a certain sound effect clues you into something creeping up on you just outside of your field of vision. You'll be switching through your arsenal versus wasting time on reload animations, dropping flashbangs on those head poppers before they can get close enough to one-shot you. Yeah, that is annoying as hell. And using other grenades to clear some space when you've maybe let a few too many of them get just a little too close. It's not without a few problems here and there, but it's a tense and focused ride from start to finish. And god damn if it isn't incredibly fun. But it wouldn't be Resident Evil if we didn't have tense set pieces and boss battles. And this may be where RE4 really stands out against its progenitor games. From being swarmed in a small house to fighting El Gigante, especially that first entrance. Damn it's cool. And then even having to deal with two of them later. To a sea monster battle which... Definitely happens and is some kind of a thing. I don't know. I don't hate it, so whatever. To the boss fights with our colourful rogues gallery of enemies, there are just so many awesome set pieces here. Each takes the established mechanics of the game and mixes them up just a little to keep things fresh and exciting. Whether it's standing your ground against a horde, riding a high speed minecart, luring a giant enemy into a very obvious pit trap, or being chased by… it. This game just goes from strength to strength and can feel especially tense when it feels like maybe the RNG has decided to put the squeeze on your ammo and health items. The three character boss fights are… basically fine, if a little easy when replayed with proper planning. They certainly don't commit any horrific boss fight sins like having trash mobs show up to distract you so the boss can get free hits, or have QT… oh yeah we need to talk about these. The QTEs in RE4 are bad. QTEs are not fundamentally a bad thing. No mechanic really is. It's all a matter of how it's implemented. My first memory of QTEs come from Shenmue, where they form one of the two major combat control styles. In this game, they are well integrated. They were introduced in an easy and non-threatening way. Then you are given ample opportunity to practice them with minimal consequences. And they are telegraphed well in advance when it's for real. They were further upgraded in Shenmue 2 by making it so failing a single button press didn't end the fight, but rather put you on the back foot while giving you a chance to recover. So, you are very well trained and ready for these when they happen. In RE4 though, they're a forgettable gimmick that pops up now and then when the developers were getting worried that you weren't being engaged by something. This happens so sporadically throughout the game that even now, almost 20 years after the game came out, I still got caught out by this. <laughs> because I thought we were in a conversation and I'd relax the controller for just a moment. As such, I had to rewatch the whole damn thing again from the start. The worst offender is right here at the end of the minecart section, simply because messing this up will send you all the way back to the start of this. Consider that for a moment. You are playing the game like a boss, keeping this ever escalating horde of enemies at bay, using your entire arsenal to maximum effect and finding time to jump between cars and pick up dropped items, only to die and have to do it all again for the sake of not mashing the right button at the right moment. That is bad game design. What really sucks though is that these QTEs, among other things, are actually training you for your fight with Krauser, and this battle is probably the most exciting in the game, and the QTEs are actually part of that. Most of us know by now that Krauser is weak to the knife as it stunlocks him, this incentivizes you to get up close and personal with him, which very often starts one of these little QTE battles. And it's really fun and exciting. This fight makes my heart race even now. It's an insanely macho power fantasy. So while I see what these QTEs were setting me up for, they really needed implementing in a fairer way. So I guess it's now time to talk about the annoying elephant in the room. She's not that bad really. Some have said that RE4 is an entire game that's basically an escort mission. 
Back in the PS2 era, escort quests were the absolute worst, as poor AI and pathing meant that failing a mission was as much a matter of RNG as it was your skill with the game. Basically, people hated them, and there's a reason they aren't a big part of modern games. The problem is, is that within an action game, you might only have one or maybe two escort missions, which, when you consider how much work and pressure developers can be under at the best of times, generally led them to fudge it or leave it at good enough versus getting it absolutely perfect. But given that a much larger chunk of RE4 was going to revolve around escorting Ashley, Capcom were much more willing to invest time and resources into getting it right. It's basically the opposite situation to how they managed the QTEs. Again, these mechanics aren't bad in and of themselves. It's just that when they are thrown in without a lot of thought versus being an integral part of the game, they just feel like sloppy half measures. Think about how many Xbox 360 and PS3 games had bad cover-based combat hacked in to chase trends back in the day, and I'd wager we can all name at least one game that has stamina management combat and hard boss fights but really doesn't get how Dark Souls made those things work. Even so, I'd say overall the majority of this game has very little escorting going on. Yes, there's a few chapters where you are very closely followed around by Ashley, and there was one instance where she somehow got in the way of my shotgun, but her AI is overall good enough that she generally isn't much of a problem. There are certain set pieces where she can be secured away either in a box or at the top of some stairs while you deal with a particularly dangerous creature or swarm. And there is one section where you control her, which isn't anything to complain about really. It's just a change of pace since you don't have all your guns and upgrades to fight back, but she does okay. The story contrives to remove her from your party for the majority of the game from Salazar's castle onwards. So I'd say around two thirds if not more of the game's playtime is spent with just Leon alone. So she's not really any issue. Well, maybe this section. Screw this section. RE4 did exactly what it set out to do. It changed Resident Evil completely and injected something fresh and exciting into the game. Whether or not this was the right move overall is another question entirely. I mean, we got one really good game out of it and... I'll be honest, I don't mind RE5 though, it's considerably less charming than 4. And then, we got 6. I tried so hard with this game, but it just didn't work for me at all. I'm not 100% sure why Capcom decided that RE had to be centred on the same half a dozen people from the first couple of games or why it felt like it needed to be constantly raising the stakes and the threat level. Horror doesn't have to be big and grand to be scary after all. That aside though, Resident Evil 4 is a truly amazing game. It was amazing when it came out, and it holds up just as well now as it did then. It's a timeless classic, that had a huge impact on not only the series but action games in general. I mean, it's because of RE4 that we got Dead Space, and that's a whole other rabbit hole to dive down one day. So this was a great time, and I wholeheartedly recommend this original version of the game to anyone of any age. I think most of us know that graphics don't make the game, but with this texture mod that's barely even an issue. I am very excited for the remake. I probably won't cover it on my channel until much later in the year, or maybe even next year, but it looks like a thing of beauty. So that's the video guys, that's RE4, and that's it for me. Thanks for hanging out today. Well hey there you, why haven't you run off to find more interesting content yet? Well, since you're here and I've got a few minutes then, I'll just say thank you for making it all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate you staying with me till the end. I experimented with adding some music to this one so I hope it wasn't too jarring and actually benefited the video. I made my content for February and March out of sequence, so here at the time of writing I have no idea what kind of game I'm in the mood for next. We've been doing a lot of horror lately, and while that's fine, it might be time to take a U-turn into something else for a while. Maybe another immersive sim or adventure game. Anyway, I'll probably have a post up not long after this video drops to talk about that. Thanks again for watching to the end. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Facebook page and leave me a comment to ramp up the engagement. Until next time, peace out.